Attention humans, I am Optimus Prime. You're listening to Two Strangers, One Podcast. Go to iTunes now and subscribe. For Android users, we are available on the Stitcher app for Google. Now, here's Chris and Kristen. Transform and roll out. He is a comic book nerd. In brightest day and darkest night. We can learn a lot from comics. She is a reality TV junkie. No idea. Snooki had her baby. A dollar makes me holla. Chris likes sci-fi. They keep your, they do a brain transplant into this whole new body, but it's you. Kristen likes celebrity gossip. What do you news. Oh, more breaking news? It's not news? official. Uh-huh. Official. Before it was just a rumor. Hey, Stu, our pets moved back in together. What do they have in common? Nothing. You're listening to Two Strangers, One Podcast. Now, here's Chris and Kristen. Okay, and we're here. This is uh, Chris of Two Strangers, One Podcast, and I'm interviewing Mr. George Kirk- Christick, right? That's Christick. right, you got it in one. And just for our fans, I do want to let them know that I'm going to try not to repeat the questions from the Toonami Faithful podcast. Um, that was episode 22. That's Toonami Faithful. George, just to let you know, uh, the kid Paul from the Toonami podcast, uh, him and I actually met at a Rochester convention up here. It was ca- It's called RockCon, and it's uh, the mm-hmm. anime sci-fi convention. So him and I had like a, I would say probably, probably about a 45-minute conversation, and we were talking about uh, Megas XLR. So you're getting a lot oh, wow. of love. You're getting a a lot of love from upstate New York, you know. I appreciate it, and and, and right back, right back at upstate New York. I spent some time up there, so I wish, I wish when I was there we had all these awesome cons. Uh, after I left, like now it seems that there's there's so many cons in the New York and Jersey area, so that's really awesome. And when did you live down here or, or, or over here? Because you're West Coast now, right? Yeah, I'm West Coast now. I spent a lot of time in the '90s uh-huh. um, uh, because uh, a bunch of us nerd went to art school. Um, at SVA, which is in Manhattan, but we lived in Jersey and we spent time in upstate New York as well. So yeah. Oh, so we, you were bridge and tunnel we, crowd. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we were. We were. But uh, when I was there, we had what did we have? We had one pretty good convention. It was like a Halloween convention. Was it Chiller? Maybe. Yeah, I think that was it. But that was that was like our only convention. We had that, and then we had like the Star Trek convention that they had at, at the hotel across from uh, Madison Square, uh, and I, I forget the name of the hotel, but that's all we had at the time in the nineties. Yeah, I was, I can't... It was a dark time. <laughs> I know they, they recently, they have, like, a lot of the big Apple Comic Cons. Like, they're there, like, twice a year, three times a year. And I've never That's had a right. chance to go. I've always, like, every time it comes up, I just, I never get a chance to go. And now they have the, they have the one, the Jacob Javits Center, the one they just That's had, right. the New York Comic Con. Yeah, the New York Comic Con. I heard that pretty, pretty big these days. Yeah, I, I'm just surprised because the Javits Center is kind of small. I don't oh, understand how okay. they would... I mean, because I've been there for car shows, and it's pretty mm-hmm. much... You go up one end, you come around, come back the other end, and you're done. So I can only yeah. imagine what they did at the Comic Con there. Yeah, I, heard, I, I did hear some complaints that it's getting a little crowded, but as is San Diego, so <laughs> I guess I guess that's good, right? You know, more nerds packing packing rooms is a good thing. Yeah, I do want to uh, apologize that my co-host isn't here. She's out at a bachelorette party today. It's no, no, a, that's, uh... that's much more important than talking about cartoons. <laughs> If Not she was here, she would she would definitely um, – well, she'd probably be quiet because that's the whole gist of our show. I'm the nerd. She's the uh, – <laughs> she's like the celebrity person, celebrity gossip reality TV show. Right so on, right on. just to let and, our – and, uh-huh. and, and, yeah, don't don't be afraid to reiterate any questions. You, you mentioned, like, you don't want to reiterate the questions from the, the previous uh, podcasts I've done. And feel free to because maybe some of your um, listeners haven't, you know, plugged into those. So oh, yeah. Well, I like. – yeah, I definitely want them to – for the listeners to go check out the Toonami Faithful podcast because it's a good podcast. And like I said, Paul and I spoke for about 45 minutes and, you know, I want the listeners to check them out, you know, share the love, you know. (laughs) Oh, of course, of course. And so to let our listeners know, for those, you know, you're a writer for Cartoons and Cartoon Network. You've done the MTV show. There was a show called Downtown in the 90s. Uh, mm-hmm. M- Magus XLR, which was what we're talking about today. Um, one of my favorite shows. That was about 2004, right? That's right. Yeah, I think we, we debuted in 2004 and then we got canceled in 2005, which is 
unfortunately, <laughs> the, the way things go with the shows we make, but I see that as a, like a, a mark of honor. Like, we don't want a long-running show that everybody loves. We want like a short-running show that a few people really love. Yeah, like like The Office and from Great Britain. You know, the original Office was only two seasons. You know, the, yeah, the, that's right. The Brits that's right. seem to have some sort of a deadline on their shows, and some of the most brilliant shows only lasted a season or two. You know, the the Office is the first one that comes to my mind. You totally. Know, so. And recently, we a show that the whole Megas crew did recently for Disney XD was Megas, uh, not Megas. It was Motor City, um, uh-huh. and we only got one season on that. We just recently got canceled on that. But I feel that we learned a lot. Of, we took a lot of the lessons we learned from Megas and, and put it into Motor City. It's a, it's an amazing show. It's it's a beautiful, mind boggling action. Uh, they let us do a lot of the stuff that we just technology wise and budget wise we couldn't do on Megas. So if you haven't checked it out, you know, check it out totally. Yeah, I was, and I had mentioned this to our listeners before. Um, what I loved about Motor City was it was action packed. And for a show, you know, you know, people don't usually think Disney action. Well, I mean, you know, Disney has its reputation, but that show, you know, you can be family friendly and still be interesting and exciting. And, you know, it's not like, you know, it's not Mickey Mouse jumping on cars with like lightsabers and stuff like that. It's uh, <laughs> and I had spoken to you. We had gone back and forth on Twitter. All these shows exist in the same universe? Downtown, that's, Megas XLR, Motor City? That's kind of like our, our unwritten internal like head canon, you know? Oh, okay. It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not official, but it is official to our team, right? You know, mm-hmm. Chris Pernowski and Jody Schaefer and myself. Like, if you notice, there is one character that is in each show, mm-hmm. um, and kind of we're tracking, like, we're basically the continuity that we're laying down internally. Um, mm-hmm. And for fans who want to, you know, kind of think in these terms, we have this one character, Goat. Mm-hmm. And uh, we introduced him in Downtown, um, and then we brought him back for Megas, which in our mind happened after Downtown, right? Mm-hmm. And then Motor City is is what happens in the future, like in like 100 or 200 years after Megas. Um, and we still have that character there, although he has a different name, and he's evolved a bit. But, you know, to us, it still goes. So, he yeah, has the I handlebar mean, mustache. and <laughs> Exactly, exactly. Yeah, we had to change the name, but uh, we, we in our hearts, that still goes. Gotcha, gotcha. And let me tell you, for some reason, Goat, does is, is Goat have any kind of influence by George Carlin, or is that just my brain? Is that my brain just putting, applicating something to, no? Yeah, I could, I could see, yeah, I could see how I could make that connection. But I don't Goat, know why. Actually, I, no, no, he had, he kind of, he kind of has that gruff voice, and also he has a, a similar facial structure, but Goat is actually based on our buddy Goat, who looks just like that. Oh, okay, um, so there's a real guy. There's a real guy, and, and we see him as our good luck charm, others might see him as the Mark of Doom because every time we put him <laughs> in a show it gets cancelled but uh, we're going to keep putting him in shows like he is um, he's one of our buddies that we used to you know make uh, cartoons with and, and short films with um, and we always we always make sure that he's in any show and also he did the voice of Goat in uh, Downtown and then he did the voice of Goat in Megas um, and hopefully on these other projects we're doing you know I, I've already written him into a few projects so uh, if they <laughs> awesome. go he's definitely coming back he's like the R2-D2 C-3PO he's in every reiteration <laughs> The one exactly. common character. That yeah, he's like adventure. Cliff Clavin in the Pixar movies. You know, we gotta have we gotta have a certain character and a certain voice actor in each each of our productions. So, yeah. <laughs> that is so awesome. See here on the, our show, Two Strangers One Podcast, we kind of have a curse. Every time we mention certain things, they they go awry. A couple of weeks later, uh, you know, uh, we had spoken about Will and Jada. About a week later, they announced that they were having problems in their marriage. Uh, Bam Margera from Viva La Bam and Jackass and his wife. They get them getting a divorce. Danny DeVito and Rio Perlman. We every time we mention people that we like, they have mm-hmm. unfortunate they have unfortunate circumstances later. So yeah. if our curse affected Motor City, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's funny. I, it's, it's, I think there was, I think it was, um, at the end of the day, I think it was a bad fit. I don't think that, although Disney really supported us and they gave us a wonderful budget and a lot of support and, you know, uh, I don't think that that show is quite right for their audience. Um, so, you know, we're, we're looking at trying to, to bring it to another audience or trying to, to find another way to continue the story. Um, so I think it was just one of those cases where they, they really supported it. They saw the, you know, the, the awesomeness in it. It's just that um, their audience... The audience, you know, skews a little bit younger, and also they want certain things that Motor City was not delivering on, whereas we, we give the action and we give the character, 
I think maybe for some kids it was a little, the, the young kids, I mean, they have a lot, their viewership runs a lot younger, so mm-hmm. there was a, a bit of a disconnect there. Well, like, I had, I'm a big, big fan of uh, Kevin Smith, along with your work, obviously, and um, he had mentioned, I had went to a speaking engagement, and he was talking about, like, Disney, with Disney XD, uh, that they're trying to target young a young male audience, that, uh, mm-hmm. you know, they already have the girls with all the princesses and the Mulans and the you know, Brave and and Little Mermaid and Snow White, that like the Disney XD channel was Disney's attempt to reach young males. Did did you feel that or did they try to, did they bring that up to you um, or? Yeah, I mean, obviously I wasn't directly connected to the, the strategic vision of, of things, but whatever whatever went down, I felt that they weren't happy with the, the people we connected with, the viewership that we connected with. So I think I think also the thing I heard is that Disney XD is getting a, a lot better ratings with live action than animation. Wow. Um, and as you know, sometimes animation costs a lot more. It takes a lot more time than animation. Uh, or, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, animation takes a lot more time and money than live action. So I think maybe someone took a look at the at the numbers and they were like, all right, more live action, more sitcoms. <laughs> um, but again, you know, I'm, I'm speaking for them, which is always dangerous. But uh, that's kind of the, some of the things that I've heard. Yeah, okay. And also just to, I just want to tell the audience that I am like so not, I love the show. I love the product. I'm not into the industry. And I wish I could had I wish I could have like more industry questions, but I'm just more coming from a, like a fanboy point of view. <laughs> of course, of course, yeah. And I, I have I have so little insight into the industry because again I'm, I'm kind of with you. Like I like making the stuff. Um, I, I'm not really good at selling it or marketing it or you know figuring out how the bean counters work. That's that's not where my headspace is. <laughs> I wish it was. I think we'd be a lot more successful. But yeah, <laughs> I like making cool stuff. And um, so with Megas XLR, I, I, I had sent you a bunch of questions beforehand, and I'm. T- totally not even following the uh, list but no, um that's funny. you said you said you went to art school in new york is is that where you met jody schaefer exactly yeah uh jody schaefer and chris Bernowski and i all went to school of visual arts and they were in the animation program and i was in the film program uh-huh. and we we just started working together and we we're making crazy films on the weekends and shorts and live action and comedy and um uh, you know, we kind of built the relationship that we're we're still you know working on now. Is um, we just kind of help each other on the projects. And um, after school, after we finished uh, school, uh, Jeffrey Schaefer and I were just sitting around one day. Uh, I think we were watching like Robot Wars and Robotech and. We were playing video games, and we're like, dude, man, wouldn't it be awesome just to combine all this? And I think that was when we, we actually started talking about Megas. And um, Jody, at the time, bought, like, a really fast PC for the time, which I'm sure is, like, super snail slow, and we can't even boot it up anymore. Um, but he was like, dude, let's just make a trailer on my computer, um, and let's get it out there. And I was like, that's a great idea. So uh, Jody and another friend of ours, Tony Kupo, who was the inspiration for Coop, by the way, who lives in Jersey City, and we pulled a lot of uh, inspiration and stories for him. He okay. came on and helped us, and Chris helped us, and we made this uh, short trailer, and we outputted it to videotape, so this tells you like how long ago this was. <laughs> um, and we did what they tell you never to do, uh, which is we went to Comic-Con, and we ran down a Cartoon Network exec, <laughs> and we shoved this videotape in our hand, and we're like... Okay, we'll never hear from her again. Like, that's that's so bad. You're not supposed to do that. Mm-hmm. And oddly enough, she called us back in three months, and she was like, hey, I want to talk to you guys about it. And that, that was kind of like the, the genesis of Vegas. Wow. Now, what program did you use? Because I'm fascinated. Like, what program was used on the computer for you to do homemade animation? Wow. Do you remember? <laughs> I, I, I can't remember, but I remember it was really janky. It was like we had such a hard time with it, and I remember we, we were coloring digitally, and that was like really back in the early days of doing things digitally, so... We had a lot of problems, and I remember we had to buy like more motherboards and more memory, and it was just it was insane. I mean, now you can do everything that it took us like a month to do, um, and probably took us you know, thousands of dollars. You can do it on our iPad in two minutes. But um, yeah, yeah, I can I can find out. I'll, I can ping Jody and find out what what the, the tech was on that. Yeah, I'm just I'm just curious because you know, like you said, nowadays people can put stuff out on their computer relatively quick, and I had like all the new shows, not new shows excuse me like the adult swim shows on Cartoon mm-hmm. Network at night like the Aqua Teen Hunger Force and I had even remembered um, I believe from Titmouse Studios Metalocalypse uh, oh, yeah. I believe he was he was selling his laptop or it was he was raffling it off or, or uh, auctioning it off with like scripts and stuff I, like that or I don't I don't doubt it <laughs> I don't doubt it yeah um, and that, that's kind of the exciting thing is now 
now that like and this is what I say to a lot of people, you know, who who are in my who are I guess they're now in the position I was, you know, ten years ago. It's like it's so awesome that you can just make something and just post to YouTube, right? Mm-hmm. You don't have to like stalk a cartoon network executive and shove a videotape in their hands. <laughs> like you can you can just put it out there and people will see your stuff and that's really exciting. And and I'd encourage everyone who wants to make cartoons or make movies or, you know, do videos, just do it, man. Just like shoot it, cut it and put it out there. Because it's it's a total like the paradigm is totally not even shifted, it's been destroyed. <laughs> um but that's and that's the thing, you know, that kind of segues into what Chris and I and Jerry are trying to do with getting the rights back to our shows. Uh, and just, you know, trying to get out of the system that it doesn't get what we're trying to do. Um, they get it until they lose patience with like, oh, you didn't, you didn't meet the ad revenue, you didn't get the ratings. And the thing that they don't understand is like sometimes it takes, it takes a little while to find an audience or to find the right audience. Of course. Um, so yeah, yeah. Yeah. All the hit shows, if you go back to the first season, in my mind, I think of like a Seinfeld, you know, when Seinfeld came out, it wasn't well received in the beginning and then it built its audience, you know, it's, uh, exactly. Or Family Guy, you know, oh, Family Guy. Oh, was, that's right. <laughs> yeah, dead for a couple of years, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, in today's climate, you don't have much uh, uh, like leeway. Uh, they have they have certain numbers projected, and if you don't meet them, they cut you right away. The other thing, creatively, is you're still figuring your show out. You know, your your directing team is still figuring out the visual tone of the show. The writing team is still figuring out the characters and the humor. So if they cut you after one season, it's it's, it's a bit of a pity, you know, because at the end of the first season, you're starting to hit your creative stride. Yeah. Uh, but unfortunately, that's you know that's the industry. Oh man. And that's what I loved about Megas XLR because it was it was this world that had you know pro wrestling and uh, oh, yeah. superheroes and aliens and it's like anything can happen kind of world you know where just like two regular guys can you know, <laughs> pilot a giant robot. It was just like this awesome world, and it's a place I want to live. <laughs> you know, it's a place I want to <laughs> go. That's awesome to hear because I mean that was our goal, right? It was. Um... And I have to give it to Cartoon Network that the, the creative executives really supported us. You know, they were like, they were like, okay, this is your, this is your world. Have fun with it. They gave us this huge sandbox and they let us play. And, and that was kind of our goal is to like, you put pause on reality and just have fun. You know, there <laughs> was, awesome. there was, we asked for such a huge suspe- suspension of disbelief for every episode. <laughs> uh, but we wanted you guys to, to have fun on that ride. I mean, every episode, and even the series itself, was a big what if. You know, mm-hmm. what if a regular dude got a giant robot? What would he do? <laughs> what if, uh, you know, a, an evil alien showed up, but, you know, the guy that was fighting, it was too stupid to understand that it was evil. You know, what if? So, uh, you know, we had fun. We had fun, and I think, I think the audience had fun with us. And I love the idea of it's a kid who grew up playing video games. How It's not yeah, much it's, different than piling a giant robot. You know, you already had years of training. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so that, that's funny to, to speak to that, right? So that inspiration came directly from my life, and it came from a conversation with my mom. <laughs> because I was playing, and I forget which game it was. I was I'm, I'm a big gamer. I still am. Um, and I actually work with Riot Games now. Um, and so, which is, you know, that's kind of a dream come true as well. So I was playing a video game over summer break, and I believe that my I ripped the skin off of my thumbs, right? And my thumbs were bleeding. And I was like, Mom, my thumbs are bleeding. And she got really angry at me because she was like, what, you know, your thumbs aren't bleeding from like a hard day's work. They're from video games. She had no sympathy. <laughs> and she was like, you're wasting your life. And my immediate response was, dude, just wait till the aliens show up because I'm going to whoop the floor with them. <laughs> You know, so Coop is Coop is my answer to my mom. Like, you know what? <laughs> I, I did not waste my life. I'm ready for the aliens when they come. You've been training for years. This is <laughs> you're gonna be an Olympian. You're gonna be. <laughs> it's awesome. exactly, dude. I'm I'm the gold medalist of video games. <laughs> um, do, do you mind how if I ask how old you are? Or is that taboo? <laughs> I I am I am old enough old enough to know better. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm 35. So um, you know, I remember right growing around. up like Commodore 64 and you know original nintendo entertainment system and uh you know so i just you know uh like up here in rochester there's a museum the museum of play and they have a whole uh exhibit about old school like you know video the progression of video games and it's like it's so weird to see like a commodore 64 behind glass in a display (laughs) <laughs> it's like wow. Yeah, I yeah, had yeah. one of I mean, those. How is it a relic? You know. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm a kid of the the 80s and the 90s, so I remember that stuff. And you know, I, I remember wasting so much time on you know the original Xbox and 
you know, the uh, the Nintendo 64 and just yeah, <laughs> those things. They, they sucked up years of my life. <laughs> now, you had mentioned that the character based on Coop lives in Jersey City. So uh, Coop and Jamie are Northern Jersey guys? <laughs> Yeah, they're they're both yeah they're both big city guys and um, <laughs> you know both both Coop um, and and Goat are actual people who still live in Jersey City right nice. so it's like we were we were speaking to an authentic uh, story and you know some of some of the character aspects and some of the character traits are are directly pulled from these people that we know um, for instance the guy we based on Tony Cooper uh, sorry the guy we based Coop on Tony Cooper. Um, you know, he's the kind of guy, he's like that kind of friendly, jovial guy, but he seems to get into these, these situations and you're like, how on earth did that happen? <laughs> and how did you get out of that situation? I don't get it now. Um, and then, then also Goat. Goat was pretty much as Goat is in real life. That's who he was in, in Megas, you know, like <laughs> he's the guy, he's the guy who would hit on the alien shit. Like he's, he's fearless when it comes to that. That's awesome. <laughs> so, yeah. The voice of Coop was David DeLuise, son of legendary Dom DeLuise. Um, <laughs> Right. Now he's well. I don't. I think they just finished, but he's the dad on Wizards of Waverly Place. Um, that's right, right. Do you think any any way that star power could help bring back Make SXLR? Because he kind of maybe you know. Because now I'm pretty sure every 14 year old girl in the country knows his face. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, honestly, we're open to any and all help to, <laughs> to get us back. You know. So absolutely. Like um, I also know that um, C Bloom has been out on on the Twitters and on the internet. Um, helping us out, and um, he's a great guy. And I'm just looking for another way to work with him. And we're supposed to have lunch eventually, sometime before the new year. So we're trying to get together and figure stuff out. But yeah, we we had a wonderful voice cast, and they're uh, they're very active on the interwebs. So I'm sure you know. I'm sure once we actually have we have those guys rallied, um, it's going to help immensely. Yeah, David Eloise was awesome enough. One night we were all championing uh, hashtag Bring Back Megas XLR. I tweeted him. I said, you know. Help us raise awareness, and boom! Literally, like three minutes later, he retweeted it. So, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, yeah, Steve yeah. Bloom is like all over the place. I, I look at like his his Wikipedia page, and it blows my mind all the stuff that he's in. But you said in the Tsunami Faithful co- podcast that he's like he's a driving force, also, right? Like he wants to, he has the passion to bring it back. Oh, absolutely. I mean, he he is the guy in in the dark days, like a few years ago, when there was you know there was no attention on. On Megas, he, every once in a while he'd send me an email and he'd be like, "Hey, what's going on? You know, are they going to air it? Uh, are you going to do more? What's happening?" Um, and I could never give him a clear answer because I couldn't get one. But you know, the fact that he still cared, and I noticed like whenever he'd do an interview, he'd always mention Megas and how much fun he had, and we had so much fun with him. And part of the uh, the, the the joy of making the show was I remember early on when we were developing it, we were really big Cowboy Bebop fans, right? And I was like. I would just love to work with Spike and Faye, you know. Mm -hmm. That would be so awesome. And we went to the casting director, and she didn't know anime, and she didn't know who these people were. And I was like, no, no, here, you have to watch this series. Um, And she was was awesome enough that she hunted them down. She brought them in, and, you know, both Steve and Wendy were like, oh, man, this is great. I can't wait to to be part of this so it was it was kind of like a nerd's dream come true especially like an anime nerds and you know i felt that they they enjoyed the, the experience as well that's awesome now also in the show you had guest voices my particular favorite three peter cullen aka the voice of optimus prime frank welker oh, yeah. aka the voice of megatron and like a million other uh oh, cartoons yeah. And Bruce Campbell from Evil Dead and Army of Darkness. Let me ask you, and I just maybe did you purposely write roles just so you can have these guys come in, or is that like a secret? Or <laughs> no, no. Well, it was it was much more of a, a kind of a holistic you know, process in that when we would pitch out these ideas in the writers' room, where we would say like, wouldn't it be cool if Megatron and Optimus Prime team up against Coop, right? <laughs> um, and then we would follow that story through, and then we're like, hey, can we actually? Get get the voices, that would be awesome. Um, and then, you know, things like when we created Magnanimous, um, and that's the character that Bruce Campbell voiced for us, we were like, so it could be a dude that looks like Modoc, but he should have the personality of Ash, you know, from <laughs> Evil Dead. Mm-hmm. Um, and that also helped our artists and that helped our writers, right? And then we'd be like, hey, can we actually get Bruce Campbell? Because the thing is, we've always been making this, these kind of things. It's just we never had access to the budget or to the network to reach out to the actors. Mm-hmm. Um, and this, this was the first time where we actually could do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and we did. And actually, I have a funny story. I know I've told this one before, but it's, it's worth repeating of how we got Bruce 
uh, to do magnanimous. So we reached out to him through agents and stuff, and that didn't quite work. And then uh, Bruce was having, um, I think he was having some sort of a panel or a presentation or something. Mm-hmm. And Chris Parnowski, uh, the head of Titmont Studios, who was our supervising director, went there with a script to the episode, right? Uh-huh. And as, as Bruce was being, like, shuttled out with, like, his, you know, security guard and his entourage, Chris was like, Bruce, we love you. We want you to do a show for us. Please, please. And, like, the security guys were about to, like, throw him out of the, the room. <laughs> but Bruce was like, let the kid through. Nice. And, you know, Chris, Chris, you know, shoved the script in his head. Again, this is the stuff you're not supposed to do. <laughs> uh, but I guess, you know, uh, Bruce saw something in Chris that he was really sincere and that he was a super fan. And he read the script and loved it. And, you know, cut to a week later and we're recording Bruce Campbell, you know, which was, oh, which was amazing. You guys are like animation ninjas. Like you, you get to the people <laughs> that you need to get to. You know, sneak past. Yeah, we try. That's awesome. That is because you know Optimus Prime, Megatron. Oh my God! Like I remember the first time I saw that episode, I'm like, my head stopped for a second. I'm like, what's going on? That's Optimus Prime, Megatron. Ah! I know you should have seen us when we we had you know both Optimus Prime and Megatron in the booth. We were just like you know we were having nerdgasms. Our heads were, as you said, our heads were exploding as well. Because again, we are we are the nerds. Like we're we're not like on the other end in our goal and towers and uh, you know our big suits and we're not the kings of Hollywood no man we're, we're just like everybody else we're nerds we love animation we love video games and we love the same things that you guys do so when we have a chance to actually kind of enact our vision and our dreams like we we are super stoked now let me ask you with voice actors and let's just say Megas gets picked up which I'm putting forth I'm putting forth the great energy to put it towards you to bring back Megas XLR Thank if you, you had so a much. if you had a Scooby Doo moment, and you know those years when Scooby Doo had like celebrity cameos, like the Harlem Globetrotters or Batman oh, yeah. or uh, Phyllis <laughs> Diller, if Megas XLR was could have a Scooby Doo real life celebrity cameo, who mm-hmm. would you be? Who's your wish list? I mean, a person has them. Wow. Seen. Yeah. I mean, it was that's that's it's almost too hard to choose. It oh, okay. Would be a lot, right? <laughs> too much love. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we would like we would go to town. We would just go to town. But I think you know, I think uh, my first you know initial gut reaction is like go to the the sci-fi icons you know that mean so much to us, mm-hmm. and then also go to some of the comedy icons. Um, and, you know, and then, and then from there, like, you know, there's, there's sci-fi icons, there's actors that we love, you know, so, yeah, sorry, I can't give you specific, <laughs> give but, you. like, all of them, all of them, like, Everybody. you know, let's get, let, let's get Shatner in there, let's get, uh, let's oh get Mark my. Hamill in there, come on, let's, let's just do it, let's do it. Oh, man, Megas crashing a Comic-Con, so you get everybody. <laughs> that would Every, be yeah. awesome. Let's get them all. Sign, <laughs> yeah, sign me up. And the secret, how the do they get the car on top of the robot? How do they get down? Or that's just a mystery. How do I they get we, out of Megas? <laughs> yeah, we. I think we were forced to. We. Were, we ha- I think we have that explanation, right? <laughs> I think uh, we did draw schematics about like there's internal like uh, elevators, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but often, uh, again, because we we actually like to play on comedy. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think often what we do is what they they get out of the car, mm-hmm. right? We see them a- exiting the car and then cut to they're they're on the ground or they're you know fighting a monster or something so yeah but the the real answer is that there's a series of you know elevators and corridors in megas so you can actually get down oh that's awesome okay i just thought maybe the robot crouched down or something like that and they hopped off <laughs> that was... that's, that's too yeah 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 totally yeah that one too <laughs> That's awesome. Um, okay, so like I mentioned earlier, the like Adult Swim cartoons, right now they're using a lot of Flash animation, if I'm not mistaken, like a uh, Aqua Teen Hunger Force. If it meant bringing back Megas XLR, would you use Flash animation? Absolutely, and I'll tell you uh, why, because we use Flash animation on Motor City, and oh, you wouldn't know it. Awesome. Yeah, that was, that was, I think, if, if I'm not correct, that was mostly Flash with some 3D, um, and uh, yeah, so the fact is that Flash isn't what it used to be. Like, it used to be pretty derpy and, and kind of flat, uh, but what, you know, different studios are doing with it, it's amazing, especially Titmouse. So, like, Chris has really kind of blown open the, the, the doors on Flash. So, yeah, totally. I think, without a doubt, I would say that we are going to, you know, if we do Megas and if we can do Megas, it will be a Flash CG combination a la what we did on Motor City. Yeah, like you mentioned in the Toonami Fate podcast, the characters themselves were animated, but all the cars were 3D rendered in the uh, That's computer, correct. And it was so awesome. That's right. <laughs> and the robots. And the robots as well. And so, like, obviously, Megas is a combination of cars and robots. So, 
you know, I think that uh, Tim House really leveled up. So if we get the chance to do Megas, I think it's going to look amazing. Yeah, I was... If Motor City stood on the air, I would have prayed to see a scene like where they go to a junkyard and find like Coop's belt buckle or something like that. You know, <laughs> you know, somehow, That's you awesome. know, that would if they had that, I would it would blow my mind. I guess, you know, there's still there's still a chance. Um, there's there's a, yeah, there's a couple of really, really subtle nods to our previous shows in there. You'll, you have to look very closely, but they're there. I mean, the, the most overt one is Jacob is goat. Yeah. Um, but other than that, there's a couple small ones. OK, so now we're just going to shift gears just a. Uh, quick as being a fanboy you wrote for the cartoon network clone wars that's right yeah i was i was uh, on first and second season on that i'm just curious how that works do they give you like i've heard of this thing called the star wars bible where it's like mm -hmm. every character people can stay with some sort of continuity did they give you a star wars bible or is there like a place you can go to look at it or well that's that's kind of true for every show like when you start on a show they give you the show bible um, so you can kind of get up to speed really quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and for for Clone Wars, they were still kind of putting together all the documents uh, because I started when uh, it was it was basically before first season. So um, they were still putting together things and figuring out the rules and figuring out the assets and stuff. Uh, but yeah, I got I got a lot of documentation that had my name on it. That, that was watermarked, so if it ever got out, they'd know it would <laughs> fire. Um, so yes, the answer would be yes. Just curious, do you still have it, or you had to give it back? Or uh, I had to, I had to give it back. Yeah. Okay, you have to give it back. But that's I mean just. Just to hold something like that in your hand would be awesome. Yeah, the whole experience was great. It was, it was, you know, it was kind of like a dream come true. Yet another dream come true because um, <laughs> that's what you, you know. There's certain properties that you'd always want to uh, play in their sandbox, and obviously Star Wars was one of them. So uh, yeah, that was that was a wonderful experience. And I guess the next the next property I have to get my hands on is like what Star Trek. Maybe I can screw that up. <sighs> right? They need an animated series. I think that would be. <laughs> I mean, I've already, I've, they, have you seen the uh, teaser trailer for the uh, Star Trek Into Darkness, the J.J. Uh, Abrams? I, I did, but I'm a little frustrated because I'm like, okay, is that Khan or is that, um, is that uh, what's the character's name? Gary Mitchell. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure which one it is. I'm hoping that's not Khan. I hope that we're just hearing his voice. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Like, mm -hmm. I, I hope that's just a voiceover and whoever that other light-skinned yeah. character, <laughs> you know, is just somebody else. Did you get to go to Skywalker Ranch? I did. I actually got to go there a number of times, and, and that was mind blowing. You know, that was uh, you know because you're always you always think about like, oh, Skywalker Ranch, it's impossible to get onto, and it kind of was mm -hmm. uh, until you're invited. And even then, it's it's like the security is crazy, but it was it was amazing. It was amazing to you know work with the artists there um, and talk to all the awesome creative people and walk around the lake there. I'm sure you know it's called Lake Ewok. I got to walk mm -hmm. around Lake Ewok. I got to go into the archives and you know see the props and models from the, the the original trilogy so it was like it was pretty mind-blowing so when you wrote did you write at skywalker ranch or you just you wrote at your office like where, where do you write for like clone wars i'm just yeah of course at, at that time because we were still figuring things out we'd go up there for meetings and then we'd come home and write and then email stuff in awesome. um and i think if i believe the, the current season they may actually have writers on staff at the ranch mm -hmm. but i haven't i haven't been on the show for a couple of seasons so i don't know exactly how it's how it's being worked these days okay like i watch the show and it is so awesome it's like in my opinion it's everything the prequels should have been you know exploring yeah. all yeah. these side uh, characters and i like where it went uh, you know it's it's well, also when you when you have a tv series you have so much more time and so much more bandwidth instead of you know uh two hours mm -hmm. um so you have seasons and seasons to explore characters and try new things out and so that's 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 kind of why, you know, uh, TV excites me versus mm -hmm. film, because uh, you have a lot of time to tell a lot of story. Yeah, like, back to Megas XLR, I love that world. You know, I want to live in that world, <laughs> you know. I want... <laughs> I'm going to quote people. you on that. That's awesome. <laughs> I want to live in that world. It's, it's you know, video games and... I, it just, for some reason, rest, it just reminds me of, like, pro wrestling and superheroes and, you know, yeah. Sailor Moon and giant robots and... Um, what, what's great is all, all the things that you're mentioning is all the stuff that we love, right? So. Yeah. We we were given the keys to the kingdom, and we made the show that we would want to watch. So it, it, it explored everything that we love. We love pro wrestling, video games, anime, you know, uh, zany comedy. Um, so, you know, they were like, okay, go have fun. And we did, and, you know, we got two seasons, which is pretty good for us. Our track record is usually one season or less, so it's pretty good. <laughs> and the original, the original head on the Magus that Coop uh, eventually put his hot rod on, 
looked an awful lot like Soundwave. <laughs> oh yeah, of course, of course, man, totally. totally. That's you know, yeah. and sound. In my opinion, obviously. Soundwave was the coolest, you know, because he was always calm and collected. He never lost, never lost his cool. He was always, you know, he was a loyal soldier. <laughs> he never, yeah. you know, he was he, he was the Boba Fett of Transformers. <laughs> I think that's why everybody liked him. You know, he stood in the back, uh, but you could tell he had something going on, right? Yeah, like he 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 was plugged into the big plan. <laughs> you know, had something really did have happened to Megatron, I'm pretty sure he would have knocked Starscream on his. He would have just like you know. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. As soon as like Megatron's armor melted, uh, you know, he would shoot Starscream in the back. And he'd be like, <laughs> "What's up? I'm taking over." <laughs> back to uh, Star Wars because I'm just fascinated. What are your ideas on Episode Seven? You don't. It's just too broad to go. <laughs> um, on, on the I'm sorry to clarify the the new films, right? The, the new Star out. Wars, because in my opinion, yeah. I'm hoping. I know it sounds weird being coming from fanboy. Yeah, I want to know what happens to Han Solo and Leia and. and Luke, but I wanted like the prequels. I wanted to jump another thirty years in the future. You know, I, I think you can still have you can still have Mark Hamill. He doesn't even need makeup. He's aged thirty years. You know, he can come back in like a Yoda capacity. But um, mm-hmm. like, what are you looking for? I mean, is that just a broad, broad question? Yeah, I mean, it, it seems that it seems that the news has polarized a lot of uh, Star Wars fans. Um, you have one camp that's like, no, you know, the haters are going to hate, right? Mm-hmm. And then you have the other camp that's like, this is awesome, this is amazing, I can't wait to come back to that world. Kind of like what you were saying about Megas, that's how I feel about this. Like, I was that fall into this camp. Like, I'm so happy to be coming back into this world, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm so happy that we're going to be exploring, you know, our characters that, that we had such a strong emotional connection to that, you know, we have these stories that we kind of, we kind of just end it. It's like, okay, and the Emperor's dead, done, right? And you're like, <laughs> but there's still, there's still a lot of things to explore out there, you know? Mm-hmm. So I'm really excited. And, you know, the things that I've been hearing have, have made me even more excited. So, I I can't wait for it, and this is this is stuff that us you know nerds have been talking about forever, right? Like you know what happens to Luke and Han, you know what happens to to Leia, mm-hmm. what you know do they start building up the Jedi again? What's going on? Um, so you know there's there's also other aspects of the continuity that I'm sure they're going to follow through on, and those are exciting as well. So yes, yeah. now there is a ton wait. of books about af- what happens after you know the original series, the original trilogy. Sure. That's going to be sure. all thrown out the window. You know what I'm saying? Like so, all the, uh, yeah. the Timothy Zahn stuff and the... I'm trying to... You know, I, Timothy Zahn was like my favorite. Have you... I'm pretty sure you've read like the books or have you? I don't know. So so this is this is what I'll say, right? Uh-huh. Um, even, even as a kid, I felt that the stuff that was not in the films uh-huh. didn't count. <laughs> you know, so... So, but, you know, I'm not saying, I'm just saying that's for me personally. I know that there's a lot of awesome stuff out there. And actually, I bought a lot of the EU figures, um, but I just couldn't connect to the stories uh, mm-hmm. because I felt it happened off screen. Um, so I think that's probably how, you know, uh, they're moving forward with it. That they're saying that the EU, um, you can kind of, you can enjoy it, but it's a separate box. It's like, it's self-contained and it's over here. And if you want it, it's awesome, but it does not directly uh, plug into, uh, you know, the films or what, what's going to happen from there. And that, for me, that feels right. That feels organic because even as a kid, you're like, you know, why is Luke Skywalker pink and he has three lightsabers? It doesn't, what? You know, <laughs> so not to say that that stuff isn't awesome. Like, uh, you know, I have friends who are huge EU fans and I can appreciate the fact that they explored a lot of stuff, which is great. And it kept the franchise alive during dark times like i'm sure you remember like it, i think it was like the early 90s mid 90s where there was nothing star wars there was like yeah. timothy's on and that was it yeah. um there were no there were no toys there was no merchandise there was no media uh once in a while you could get a pc game um you know it was like tie fighter <laughs> tie like, fighter yep <laughs> tie fighter versus yeah, X-Wing. <laughs> totally um and then dark empire um so i really appreciate that it, it gave the fans something to go to um but it, much like you know much like they did with the, the star trek stuff like that you have all these you have like literally thousands of star trek books oh yeah you know about like what kirk and spock did on a way mission and, and you're like yeah that so doesn't make any sense compared <laughs> to anything that i've ever seen on the screen um so uh, sorry that's a long-winded answer yeah. no no that's I'm, i love getting your side of it because spoiler alert or whatever in the books you know han and leia have kids you know jason right, yeah. jaina baby anakin uh, luke's with mara jade or he would mess around with Mara Jade. There's all these 
you know, right. that's like a major, major uh, branch. And I'm wondering if they're going to follow through with the movies or they're just going to like toss it out the window. Because I remember I read one book that like said C-3PO was a thousand years old, you know, that sure. he's been around sure. forever. Now, of course, you can say maybe he is a thousand years old and Anakin repurposed him and sort of rebooted him in, you know, The Phantom Menace. You know, that now you're really stretching the fanboy. <laughs> like, yeah, totally. Yeah. And actually, I have to correct myself now that you, you reminded me. I recently read uh, the book about the Millennium Falcon. I think it's titled like Millennium Falcon. Wow. Um, and that was, that was a bunch of EU stuff. And that was like Han and Leia, you know, driving around space with their kids or their nephews or something. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I have dabbled in the EU. <laughs> it's awesome. You know, for what, like you said, for wetting your whistle, for, for wetting your appetite for, you know, Star Wars. Because once again, in the mid-90s, you know, 35, I was going to high school. I went to high school between 91 and 95. Living in New York City, taking the subway, you know, going from downtown Manhattan to downtown Brooklyn. You know, it's a long train ride. It's an hour and 15 minutes. So I had a lot of reading time, you know, and I, yeah. I read a lot of the Star Wars books. That was that was my time. When I think of the Star Wars experience, the universe it takes me back that right back to taking the d train to dekalb avenue downtown brooklyn um so uh, totally. and when we were when we were uh going to sva we would often uh sva is on 23rd street and i don't know if it's still there but the headquarters of hasbro used to be on 23rd street and we used to walk by hasbro and they would often have all these displays for uh, Toy Fair, um, and they would have like toys and and you know uh, different uh, prototypes and stuff, and they would throw all that stuff in the garbage bin. And we used to dumpster dive hey. behind the headquarters <laughs> of Hasbro, and we found we find all kinds of crazy stuff. Like it was usually GI Joe and Transformers, but then towards the end, it started to be more Star Wars stuff. Nice. Oh, <laughs> that's the fanboy me is so like giddy. <laughs> <laughs> And did you ever go down to like uh, Forbidden Planet Comics? Oh, all the like, time. Oh, like yeah. I remember we, back we, in the day we, when it was uh, before it was on 12th Street. It was on was it on 11th Street or 10th Street? I forgot exactly where it was. Yeah, and they had that that, that crazy dingy basement dungeon. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that yeah, was awesome. Old... Yeah. And uh, we, for a while there, my godbrother, who was Mr. New York 1982, very well-built, muscular guy, wow. he was their security guy. And, you know, oh, wow. when he worked there, oh, my God, when I, you know, this is when I was a kid. He used to, he had long boxes in his room, and it was, you know, he had shelves, right? Like, I would say about a foot down from a ceiling across all his rooms. He had, like, all the He-Man figures, all these. He was a big kid, so that's what yeah, yeah. He, he exposed me to, like, like all the comic book world and he looked like he man he he wow. he went to a couple of personal appearances as he man uh for toys r us and when he worked there but he used to tell me stories man he used to <laughs> he used to have to knock some kids out <laughs> <laughs> i was probably one of those kids i would go in there and start hyperventilating and be like oh my gosh they released the galactus <laughs> and he but he was it was, it was loss prevention you know security and he was a big muscular guy and um then he, 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 there were also nights he was a bouncer at Studio 54, so <laughs> that shows you how long ago oh, it was. Wow. Um, unfortunately, wow. he passed away, but, you know, he was he was my superhero growing up. You know, he was just this big, muscular dude and just awesome. Like I said, he was Mr. New York, 1982. Um, that, that's amazing. I mean, you you had the real life He-Man, and yeah. he, kind of, he kind of brought you into fandom. That's very cool, man. That's yeah. very cool. I remember, like, he had, th- once again, I was a kid. I had never seen the Alien movies, and he had, like, the model alien, and that scared the living daylights out of me. When I was a kid seeing that thing, and I hadn't even seen the movie yet, just seeing this creepy thing with things coming out of its back with a long head and its teeth bared, oh my, it was terrifying, terrifying. Okay, you've technically worked for both Disney and Lucasfilm. What yes. is what's your opinion on the merger? Or you don't want to for politic reasons you don't want to go into it or No, no, I think I think again anything that gets us fans more playtime, you know, mm-hmm. like again going back to what you said, I want to live in that world. So anything that gets me closer to that, I'm all for, right? Mm-hmm. So the fact that you have, you know, Disney who is a, is a huge corporation uh for better or worse Right, mm-hmm. they can they can support this. Right, they can pull the trigger and say, "All right, we're going to shoot three films simultaneous. We're going to market them. We're going to get the merchandise out. We're going to, you know, we're going to we're going to do it upright." And whereas Lucasfilm, and this is something a lot of people don't understand, Lucasfilm was uh, a very small company. Right, it was all independently run, independently financed. Like they didn't have 
any big investors. They weren't plugged into distribution. Um, so now they're going to get all that. They're going to have a huge uh, support structure mm -hmm. and infrastructure and also distribution, marketing, etc. Oh um, as you know, you know, Lucas, we partner up with Fox. Um, but now it, it'll be like part and parcel. So from the standpoint of me being a fan who wants, you know, to come back to that world, I'm very excited. Will it affect the vision? Will it affect what we get? That I can't speak to. I have no idea. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's to be determined. Will we get Pirates of the Caribbean in the Star Wars universe? <laughs> I don't know. I can't. I, I have no idea. Um, but what's what's funny enough is um, one of my pals at Lucasfilm, uh, Pablo Hidalgo. He's He's big into the publishing um, aspect of Lucasfilm, and he's also all over Twitter and Facebook. Um, he and I were having an email conversation about two years ago, and basically what we're talking about is, like, I wish someone would do with Star Wars what they're doing with Marvel, right? Mm -hmm. That they're, they're slowly building out the franchise, they're being careful, they're doing justice to the fans, but they're also letting new people into it, um, and it culminated with the Avengers, right? And I was mm -hmm. like, man, I wish someone would do that. So when the announcement happened, he pinged me back. He was like, hmm, interesting that we had this conversation about two years ago. So, <laughs> you know, in a way, they're actually doing, you know, what, what we as fans want, I think. Um, I could be proven totally wrong. And I know that there are, right now there are millions of Star Wars fans screaming in, in agony at my words. Uh, <laughs> but I guess, I guess we'll find out in 2015, right? Yeah, I'm extremely hopeful and optimistic. I think it's going to be done right. Like I mentioned earlier, like Motor City. Yes, it was family friendly, but it was exciting. It was awesome. And I think, you know, I mean, it's Disney. It's, you know, they're, they know how to tell a story, you know, like you take like a Lion King or something like that. You know, that's like, you know, I think it's going to go in the right direction. I, I'm positive and I'm happy and I'm optimistic and I think it's going to be flipping awesome. <laughs> you know, it's like. I don't, I'm not negative at all. I think it's going to be incredible. You know, and a lot of people are like, oh, you know, no, it's not going to be Mickey Mouse with a lightsaber. No, it's going to be the Star Wars universe just looking at the Clone Wars. All you have to do is like look at the Clone Wars that, you know, they have this whole like established universe that you can offshoot. I don't know. It's, I'm positive and I'm happy and I'm I'm kind of glad that Disney. I, as I look, I love George Lucas and it, <laughs> these are the three Georges. Uh, you know, George Lucas, George Carlin, George Christick. Uh, um, my, no, don't put me on that hand. Yeah. No, 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 no. You're getting not. there. You're getting there, my man. You're gonna you're gonna be legendary. <laughs> and it's it's building. It's building. And I know I no way would I equate Megas XLR to THX 1130. <laughs> but you know, you you got the stuff out there. Now you now the empire is gonna build i'm so so excited now like i said i'm i'm excited about the disney buying lucasfilm i think it's going to be done right it's been what uh since megas xlr it's been what eight years nine years since uh it's yeah, been they, out yeah 2005 is when they shut us down for a while yeah so and like you mentioned in the tsunami faithful podcast you've grown as a writer you've matured what do, would would megas xlr take like a darker direction or more serious direction or i don't know i, I'm, I don't yeah yeah i mean that, that's a really a good question. I don't think so because mm -hmm. uh, I mean one of the the founding core elements of I guess is the comedy, right? Mm -hmm. So you can't get, you can't get too dark. Okay. Uh, but what I would say is, you know, another thing that we got pinged on a lot is like, hey, no character development, you know, no real dramatic uh, storytelling. So I think I'd like to explore those things. Like I believe that you can you can evolve characters and you can still you know give the give the the, the viewer the the comedy that they want, the jokes, etc., and the physical gags. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's one area I want to explore. I um, want to see a Jamie but, and Kiva romance, unless he's her great great grandfather. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, we got to figure that. We got to figure that whole thing out. <laughs> oh, so you don't even know? Okay. <laughs> no, no. What, what you think we know what we're doing, man? Come oh, on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, um, I remember hearing about like the movie, The Usual Suspects. They said the people who wrote that movie argue with each other what scenes were real and what scenes are made up. So, so we, if even yeah, you don't know. Yeah, no, we don't. I mean, just like you asked me about like, how do they get from the car? I was just bad, so we don't know, man. <laughs> That's awesome. Like I said, I, I, you know, as much as I love Coop, I think Jamie and Kiva need to get together. Like I said, there is, a, there is a possibility he could be here with great, 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 great grandfather, which is creepy. Uh, <laughs> it is. <yeah. laughs> Recently, with Superstorm Sandy affecting Jersey, like that would be like a deep, deep episode. Superstorm Sandy with Megas. <laughs> that would be. I, I don't know why. Because I think of Jersey. You know, nowadays things evolved. You got like the Jersey Shore. You know that horrible sure. TV show. Yeah. You know, there Jersey kind of had a little bit of a 
renaissance in uh, reality TV and, you know, coming into the popular cut, Jersey Licious, Jersey Shore. You know, there's so many uh, Jersey things that Jupe and Kami, J- Coop and Jamie. Wow, I, I messed my words up. Uh, that, that's the new show, Jupe and Kami. <laughs> Jupe and Kami. <laughs> that's the Megas alternate reality. Oh, my God. <laughs> Love it. Love it's a it. red Megas. I'm sorry. I'm just uh, <laughs> no, fanboying no, no, out awesome. of here. Now, I'm, you... I'm stealing your idea. Okay. It's uh, um, I had sent you a, a tweet about what about fan fiction, a.k.a. spec scripts. And I kind of have one working. <laughs> it has to do with the Jersey Shore. Uh, <laughs> but... Right. Well, we'll, we'll have to talk. We'll have to talk. Because <laughs> it reminds me of like Star Trek The Next Generation. I heard they mm-hmm. developed episodes from fan scripts. If I could just Absolutely, get, yeah. <laughs> you can have it for free. No, no, I, mean, I that, just want the credit. <laughs> that would be that would be like an aspect. Like if we can get going again, I'd love to you know open the doors and let people pitch us. You know because we have fans who who have been you know living in this world as long as we have. So I'd love to hear from other people. And um, as someone who actually pitched to Star Trek, it was a very empowering experience, and I'd like that for our fans as well. Like I'd love. You know, whatever we set up a form or something, and we figure out a way to protect the people who are submitting as well as us. Um, mm-hmm. But you know, I'd love to open the doors for people to be like, "Hey, what if?" Or you know, "Hey, Jamie and Kiva," or whatever it is. So yeah, because again, we're you know, there's no that table doesn't exist. Like usually, you have the executive behind the table, and then you have the creative on the other end. Like we're the we're the same person, and also we're the fans. So I'd want to extend that invite out. So you work at Titmouse. Mm-hmm. You know, for anybody who's a fan of like Adult Swim, how many times <laughs> at the end of episode, you know, see each you know, I'm a, I'm a, also a huge fan of Metal Metalocalypse being a metalhead, right. which I do have to beg you also, coming from a fanboy point of view, when I asked you about the Scooby-Doo celebrity cameo, and now I know Metallica already did some voices for the pilot episode of Metalocalypse. If there was any way, shape, or form you could get Metallica in Megas XLR, <laughs> I'll, I'll be your well, personal you know slave. That, <laughs> you know that, that, that actually isn't impossible, you know, because we have a relationship uh, with them, and we have a relationship with a lot of other people uh, through Titmouse, so... That is not as crazy as you Yeah, like oh it. my god. Heavy metal with heavy metal. <laughs> heavy metal robots. Yeah, they they could be the voices of a bunch of like old school iron robots. Oh like, there you go, right? <laughs> <laughs> just, oh my goodness. Being someone who's not in industry, could you just like walk us through mm-hmm. how, uh, you know, now that the show's established, how does it go from guys talking about it to footage? Like, is, are there meetings? I mean, I know you mentioned emailing to each other. Could you just like walk us through how? How an episode comes from two guys talking about, hey, what about this, to a finished product, you know, animated. Sure, absolutely. So, as we talked about earlier, we, we kind of ambushed this executive and put this videotape in her hand, and she called us back a few months later. And then usually what happens, the usual process process is pitching, development, uh, pre-production, production, and then, you know, you go to air. So pitching is you hanging out with your buddies and saying, hey, wouldn't it be great if uh, some fat slob that plays video games can save the earth with a giant robot? Yeah, it would. Okay. Then you would, you know, do a trailer or drop some art, and then you would go and pitch it, right? You'd go to different networks, different people you know or people you don't know, and you pitch that idea. Um, and then if someone actually likes it, you would go into development. And development is figuring out the story bible, figuring out the vision for the show, the theme, the characters, mm-hmm. um, how, how things will look, how people will act, etc. And then you usually do a pilot. And if that pilot, you know, jumps through all the hurdles, you would go to production. And um, depending on where you are, they might order one season or they might order half a season or they may order two seasons. Um, and then you go into pre-production, which is... You're putting a crew together, you're uh, clarifying the designs, you're writing all the scripts, then full production, which is you actually physically making the mm-hmm. show, and then you go to air, which is obvious. So that's roughly the way you make TV. Okay, but uh, like an episode, like you say, okay, there's going to be an episode where there's a robot that looks like Mr. T, and he's being promoted by Magnanimous. Do you guys, mm-hmm. do you sit in a room? Is there a whiteboard? Do you sit with legal pads and write down notes? Exactly. All of those, oh, okay. all of those, absolutely. Yeah, you get into you get into a writer's room and you have brainstorming, you know, and you just just like what we all do at home with our buddies. We're like, wouldn't it be cool if you know the Enterprise fought a Star Destroyer? <laughs> um, and you you kind of pitch on ideas, and then together you break the the axe of the, uh, the episode. Then you send off one of the writers whoever seems to be most interested or whoever's on the schedule to go and, you know, do a first pass, you bring that in back to the room, you note it again, 
uh, you send it back out, and then you go through the revisions. Um, that's that's yeah, that's pretty much the way it goes for scripts. And and that's that's kind of consistent on most shows. Now, with like getting it actually animated, is that overseas? Mm-hmm. Is that is that well, who who tackles it, the actual you know? Sure. Um, it's it's a combination these days. Um, it seems to be that a lot of animation is coming back to the U.S. just because of Flash and, and other things. Um, most of the animation for Motor City was done at Tidmouse domestically. Oh, okay. Um, but on Megas, we had to we would do you know the designs and the layouts and the storyboarding here, and then we'd send that all to Korea, and they would animate and they would color and send it back. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I think it, it really depends on the show and it depends on how you set up your production. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's either a combination of overseas and domestic or it's all done here. Nice. Cause I've seen like in your tweets, like the whiteboards at Titmouse where like Chris Pranowski would just put up these awesome, <laughs> awesome pictures that it's a shame they're on a whiteboard because you know, they're so easily could be erased. He seems the type, like if you said, yeah, what if a star destroyer went up against the enterprise, he could put that up on the board real quick. <laughs> it seems that way. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. He's, he's full of that kind of, uh, that kind of illustrative kind of humor and also storytelling. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 Often that's what you would do. You would fi- you'd have to figure out things out visually. Uh, recently on Motor City, we had figured out a lot of our storytelling was visual, and you have to figure out okay, how can Mike drive Mutt into a robot that's also in Detroit Deluxe, but then it has to crash through the bottom, and how many layers are there between Deluxe and Motor City? And so yeah, you just get up there and you start drawing, <laughs> and and that's part of the, the joy and, and and beauty of animation is you can tell so much visually, so you don't have to have people standing talking to each other for like four pages, which gives it's pretty boring. Mm. Just a little quick self promotion. You know, I'm I'm a writer and I've and I've officially finished two books, you know, and I've worked I have a couple wow. scripts. Now, uh, I have one book out that's self published. It's called Double Jackpot. You can find it at www.doublejackpot.us. Um <laughs> Now, I'm just curious. I always like to ask people this question. What is your writing process? And just give me a second. Like, do you all write it at Titmouse? Do you go home? Do you write in the morning? Do you write at three o'clock in the morning I mean, you get up early mm-hmm. do you drink caffeine do you drink alcohol you know do you eat sure. snacks what's your what's your process i'm just curious yeah i think the answer is yes to everything in that <laughs> way um it really varies um and generally what happens is you you do not write in the room what you do is brainstorm you like pitch jokes you pitch ideas and then you go off and write so on motor city we would put in a normal day in the room breaking stories, giving notes, etc. And then they would cut you loose when it's your episode, mm-hmm. right? And then they would say, all right, you have two weeks. Uh, you're going to work from home and you're going to write and you're going to come back and you're going to deliver a script. So it's up to you. Like, you can do no work for, you know, uh, 13 out of the 14 days <laughs> and then just write all day on gotcha. the 14th day. Or you can write diligently every day or what I've found. And, and writing is very individual. Mm-hmm. I think just like creating for anyone, I'm sure for you as well when you're writing your novel, um, it depends on the situation. Also, depends on inspiration. Um, for me, uh, what I found is that I like to let my brain kind of work on autopilot, mm-hmm. and then I do better writing. So if I go, I'm going to write from 12 to 4 every day. Usually, I have to throw that stuff out <laughs> gotcha. because I'm overthinking. But if I'm like, I'm going to go play Skyrim for a week straight <laughs> and then write a week straight. I find that works a lot better because while I'm pay- playing Skyrim, I'm subconsciously working the story out. I'm working out dialogue. So when I sit down, my brain has done some of the heavy lifting, not all of it, but I find that I've already thought stuff through without you know, focusing on it. And sometimes, as you know, if you're like staring at the screen and staring at a piece of dialogue or staring at a piece of plot, it tends to not work. Um, but that's just my process. I know there's other people who get up at the crack of dawn, write all day, and so, you know everything they write is awesome. I'm not that person. Because like me, I'm I'm a three o'clock in the morning, hopped up on caffeine. I don't, I can't write drunk. I do not drink alcohol. I, I mean, I've been clean and sober since um, I'm coming up on a year in about two weeks. Um, so I don't right drink, uh, I don't smoke pot. I'm, I stay hopped up on coffee, <laughs> coffee and <laughs> cheap granola bars, like not the healthy ones, nice. the ones that like, you know, yeah. uh, that come, the yeah, bad peanut ones. butter, granola bars, uh, raisin chocolate, the ones that are horrible, unhealthy granola bars that come like 18 in a pack. That's my, I don't know what it is. And I'm not, you won't see me eating granola bars elsewhere, you know, and I'm not a health nut. Yeah. I'm not like, yeah. oh. Oh, healthy, you know, granola. No, I eat the horrible ones that you get, at, you know, that are like the store brand. <laughs> I don't know 
what it is. Well, that, that, that's part of your process. Yeah, I mean, that speaks to, like, everyone having a different, you know, there's something about it that gets you in the right frame of mind or gives your body what it needs to be creative. So, yeah, absolutely, more power <laughs> to you. I mean, there's, there's, there's guys I know who are like, uh, you know, I don't do any writing, and then the day before the script is due, I take a slug of whiskey, and then I just write. I'm like, hey, man, if that works for you, awesome. Um, you know, there's other people who are like, I only write from noon to one. That's it. I'm like, awesome, great. So it's it's very specific to the individual and also to, you know, their vision. Um, so I, I think that's what's that's awesome about creating in general. Everyone has a different way of doing it, and that's, I think, what makes things so uh, so cool and unique. Now, I'm sorry, we're way past the hour mark, but I don't want to. I don't want to end this conversation. Um, <laughs> now, I've seen on your uh, Twitter page, uh, George Christic, uh, K R S T I C, right? Yeah, I'm, <laughs> like, I'm just That's off correct. the top of yep. my head, and I'm a little like. <laughs> You're a big D and D guy. No You're a big Dungeons and Dragons guy. I, I'm glad you brought that up. I was like, wait, yeah, like, <laughs> when can I talk about the stuff I really <laughs> want to talk about? No, no. <laughs> yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So, kind of to, to wrap up everything we talked about into this, you know, final kind of conversation. Where a lot of our ideas come from is we have this thing that we call the showrunners D and D session. So we have um, a lot of um, my friends who are uh, in, the, in the animation industry, we have a monthly session, and we play, you know, we do, uh, you know, as you know, D&D is kind of like a joint narrative. You're, you're telling a story with other people, and it kind of gets your mindset and, you know, storytelling and brainstorming and what ifs. And so what we found is that a lot of our projects come out of these mm -hmm. sessions, you know, because we have we have uh, the showrunner from Green Lantern, we have a showrunner from... Um, from Family Guy, we have Chris, you know, who has you know a bunch of you know Motor City and a bunch of other shows. Mm -hmm. um, we have a producer from Warner Brothers. We have a producer from uh, Nickelodeon, and we all get together and play. And that's like kind of our brainstorming session. So you know, on in terms of professional you know successes, that's that's been awesome because it keeps our batteries charged. But also, we're a bunch of D and D nerds, <laughs> so we're just happy to get together and play. Um, and tell these, you know, stories, you know, fighting bugbears and fighting demons, gelatinous and, cubes, you know, all that, all that stuff that we love. Again, coming, coming back to that world, you know, use your your words. Like we love to live in that world. Do you run the game, or who runs the game, or does it? Uh, we have we have two. We have actually we have three different dungeon masters, but the current campaign that we're on, it's it's an old um, AD and D module, um, and we've we've been playing this particular module for I think going on three years now. Um, so yeah, we have one dungeon master that unfortunately has been been doing most of the duty, but we're gonna give him a break for the holidays. We're gonna do a Yule type D and D session, oh. so we're giving it to another dungeon master. Awesome! And I love that you say so, yeah. dungeon master DM because I have my friends when we were growing up, they were ashamed to say dungeon master or DM. They would say game master or GM. No, 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 <laughs> absolutely not. Dungeon yeah, and master, that's it. the other thing we play. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We play we play the old school first edition, and we use the the rule at our table is no digital devices um, and also you have to use the old manuals nice. right so in a way for us it's time travel it's like we're going back in time we're playing the games that we wanted to play as kids and now we actually can I had tweeted you a picture of I have a d20 tattooed on my forearm that's amazing <laughs> that is amazing and it's because my old DM unfortunately he passed away he had brain cancer I oh, loved his name was Jimmy I loved his games were so long and in depth I had friends that dropped out of college because they were too busy playing at Jimmy's house. And that's amazing. <laughs> You know, we had grew up downtown Manhattan. Um, Jimmy lived in the projects. I mean, I love him to death, but he came from poor Colombian immigrants. You know, his name was actually Jimmy. Mm -hmm. It wasn't James. His parents, who weren't Americanized, mm -hmm. called his birth certificate mm -hmm. said Jimmy. Wow. We played dirt poor. I mean, when he had, when he got his hands, he got his hands on monster manuals and you know, and all the upgrades and moon elves and everything like that. Um, but you know, we played on grid paper and photocopied like. Sure. You know, I would go yeah. to, I worked at the time, I worked at a check cashing place that had a copy machine. You know, I would copy character sheets for him. Like we were, you oh, know, yeah. but oh, we yeah. had, you know, coming from absolutely nothing. We played fantastic games, you know, like it doesn't, you know, you don't have to have a buttload of money. It's, you know, it's, uh, no, yeah, because it's, it's in your head. It's, a, you know, you're exploring imagination. It's like a creative, and, um, I think that's exercise, I guess is the best way to put it. It is, it is. Yeah. It's like, it's, um, a com 
communal creative exercise, and that's what I love about it. You know, because we're all storytellers. We all want to. We all want to live in different worlds. We all want to be different people. And and D and D gave us that kind of that entree into that world. And also, it made storytelling okay. Mm-hmm. You know, like in fact, not only okay, but you had to be a good storyteller, and you had to uh, empathize, and you had to learn, know how to write dialogue, and like. All of the things that you need to know as a, a creative individual, uh, someone working in the industry, D and D sharpened those skills, as I'm sure you're aware. And that's why, like, we're so just so excited to be able to to dive back into that world. Not that we ever left it, but it's hard to play uh, a lot of D and D when you're, you know, making a show. It gets a little difficult. Yeah. To be a fly on that wall, that showrunner D and D session, that would like, <laughs> you should run a Kickstarter and well, make that if, like the the if, reward. Yeah. <laughs> Come to it. Well, if you if you ever come out here, you de- you definitely have an open oh, invite. And we do have a friend podcast, Live in Lame. They're they're up in like Red Bluff. It's still like a six hour drive to Los Angeles. Or are you? I don't. I I'm so unfamiliar with the geography of California. But are you by L A? Is it? I don't. Or is it? Is that where things are based? At? Where's Where's Titmouse yeah, based out of? Titmouse Titmouse is in West Hollywood, so it's in the heart of Los Angeles. Okay. Yeah. And forgive my ignorance of the of yeah, the yeah. West Coast, since my listeners, please forgive my. Uh, I'm a New York City boy. I mean, no I moved crap. up to Rochester six hours up north. I, I had I had propositioned our buddies on the West Coast. I'm like, look, I'm going to crash on your couch, and then we'll drive down to Los Angeles. And he was like, cool. <laughs> so... <laughs> Right on. That's a good friend. That's a good friend. <laughs> Big shout out to Cordero. I want to leave on a high note. I don't, trust me, I can sit here and nerd out your ears. We're already well past the hour mark. <laughs> George, this has been the most intellectually stimulating conversation. And no disrespect to Kristen, my co host. I love her to death. But no. talking nerd stuff has, like, I'm charged up right now. Oh, that's great, man. I'm glad I could do that. Yeah. Is... You, should, you should go in right now for 18 hours straight. <laughs> and I am. I'm all hopped up on caffeine right now. Is there anything that we can do as fans to help you bring back Megas XLR? Absolutely. And, you know, I have to say, you specifically, and also there's a lot of other fans, you, you're doing it. Like, you're putting the word out. Um, you're, you're retweeting our tweets. You're also giving us some amazing ideas and just the general good vibes to know that you guys are out there because that does mean a lot to us. We're not some faceless corporation. We're just a couple guys who like to make cartoons, you know, and we put a lot of our own time and money and blood and sweat tears into these projects. So the fact that, you know, there's someone on the other end who appreciates it and who's excited by this, like that, that keeps us a charge, you know, that keeps us going. So just keep doing what you're doing, you know, put the word out. And, you know, as we have new developments, we're going to push those out to you guys. And whatever the next, you know, big step is, we're trying, we're still trying to figure that out, you know, whether it's Kickstarter or whether it's us trying to take it to another network or whether we're just going to go straight to, like, you know, Blu-rays or digital or make action figures. We don't know that yet, but, you know, just know that you guys are going to be the first to know, and we're going to count on you to help us get to the next stage. And um, like you mentioned on the Toonami Faithful podcast, once again, episode 22, the show is available on iTunes, but you don't see any of that money, right? Is that... Yeah, that's right. Um, Yeah, uh, it's available on iTunes and on Xbox, and unfortunately, when we signed our deals, that was before the whole digital you know, straight to digital uh, thing blew up. So that was not part of the deal at all. So they get to keep all of that. But that shouldn't yeah, stop people yeah. from, you know, downloading it because that's that's the only way they can see it now, unfortunately, because there are no DVDs, there's no Blu-rays, there, it's not being shown. Uh, so I would encourage people who are interested, who are fans, check it out. Don't download everything. Download an episode, and if you like it, download more. Obviously, I'm not making any money on that. I'm not showing for anyone, but I would want people to watch the show because we put so much, you know, effort into it, and you know, a lot of our personalities in there. So, you know, enjoy if you yeah, can. It's a great, great show, and I can't recommend it highly enough. You know, it's it's it is everything Thanks, that is awesome in a cartoon. I'm not going to chew up here anymore. Oh, okay. Go on, you're going to quote me? <laughs> oh my God, oh. <laughs> Mr. George Christick. Thank you very much for coming on the show. This is like I'm so geeking out right now it was so awesome to talk to you this episode no, will be you, coming man. out on tuesday just to let you know or uh our shows come out tuesday and thursday cool. um i try to keep it clean i gotta bleep out something you said a little earlier unless you want to keep it in yeah sorry about no, no, that. Uh, <laughs> it's all up to you i'm generally very filthy <laughs> just a warning to sure. the anyone who okay. catches this episode and goes to listen to other episodes and there is a warning straight up at the beginning of the episode you know uh listener advisors i advice. saw that yeah i was on your site <laughs> 
<laughs> we are pretty filthy. Do you want me to keep that in or you want me to bleep it out? Because I know, I mean, you're working for Disney or <laughs> I don't want to jeopardize anything that... Yeah, of course. I, I appreciate the, the concern. Yeah. Why don't we bleep it out? And that way it's actually funnier when you gotcha. have a bleep. That's what and I I've, noticed. Just to let you know, you're the very first bleep we've ever had in the episode. And I can actually... Wow. Uh, every episode when I put it up on our site, there's an explicit or... This will probably be the very first episode that doesn't have an explicit tag. So you can you have the honor yeah, of giving funny. us the first family friendly episode of Two Strangers One Podcast. Awesome. awesome. Uh, I'm gonna let you go. Understand that cool, this man. is like a uh, life changing <laughs> phone call for me talking to someone that I and, and for me admire. this is this is you know thank you man and just know for me this is like I'm I'm always excited to talk to fellow fans and someone who shares the same interest so I'm happy to come back anytime just let me know um, you know and if we have some some big announcements you know I would love to to bring them to your podcast and to your Twitter uh, but yeah man I had a great time and absolutely the invite stands if you're out in this area and we're playing oh. D&D you have a chair <laughs> waiting for you that's so awesome alright Mr. George Krissick thank you very much for calling thank you we, man. for our listeners I certainly hope you had as much fun listening as we had recording thank you for listening to Two Strangers One Podcast I'm Chris and I'm George <laughs> thank you for listening thanks guys be well Click and Hit enhancing the experience for all recreational smokers Click and Hit is a one handed portable vaporizer this smoking Pipe has a compact four-stage design, complete with a built-in, windproof, butane refillable torch lighter. The large burn chamber holds your stash of legal herb or pipe tobacco. Click the button to ignite and inhale as usual. When you are done, put it back in your pocket for later. Smoke anytime with the touch of a button. No more carrying around grinders and tins. You can leave the pipe, rolling papers, and even your lighter at home. The Click and Hit cordless vaporizer is no bigger than a normal cigar, making it the world's smallest and most discreet vaporizer. It's perfect for use in small places or shared rooms. It's efficient getting five to eight drawers from your packed chamber. It's affordable at just $19.95 each. Buy three and the shipping is free. Buy four and you get the fifth one free. Visit www.click-the-letter-n-hit.com. That's clickandhit.com. And now for listeners of Two Strangers One Podcast, you can use promo code STRANGERS and receive 10% off your purchase at clickandhit.com. That's promo code STRANGERS for 10% off your purchase. Hello listeners, this is Chris from Two Strangers One Podcast, but I'd like to announce that we are now part of Livin' Lane Podcast Entertainment. Check out our Facebook page at facebook.com slash Lane Podcast Entertainment. L-I-V-I-N-L-A-M-E Podcast Entertainment. Along with Two Strangers One Podcast, there are a bunch of brand new shows to choose from. There's The Breakdown with Filthy Phil, Shane O'Mac, and Cord bringing you the latest news in the music world. Join Joe and Carrie Fox in the Fox Den for your fix of astrology, numerology, and nature. Get your movie and television news with The Real Chat Podcast. And the big daddy that started it all, Live and Lane. So check out the Facebook for information on new episodes and updates at www.facebook.com backslash Live and Lane Podcast Entertainment. Please visit two strangers one podcast.com for links to their eBay auctions and show updates. All right, here we go, man. Go ahead. You want to read Double it? Jackpot. What is it? It is a self published book by Christopher Cologne. Chris Cologne? Smells good to me. But- <laughs> <laughs> Look at her. That broke that fucking cold little exterior. He's like, hee hee But it is spelled C O L O N. Him, punny. But. <laughs> Double Jackpot is a book about a comic book artist, Eric, who is in a loveless relationship with a material. I feel you, Eric. Lynette. And I, 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 oh, fucking. Are you oh, sure God. I didn't write this? <laughs> Uh, I, I smell sounds hauntingly familiar. He starts cheating on his girlfriend with a more creatively, su- sorry, creatively supportive woman, Nadia. Oh, I, I gotta meet her. Where's the Nadia? There's your summer girlfriend. Summer Nadia is Nadia. Nadia? Yeah, I think Nadia spelled with an A. All right. Both Lynette and uh, Nadia play the double jackpot, the largest payout in Lotto history, much like the recent Powerball. Both girls play his birth date as the winning re- as the winning numbers. Eric is now stuck between two of the country's richest women. Who will he choose? It's not that simple. This is a clever fucking idea, yeah, man. Is. Look at her, fucking. She's impressed. I am. Summer. She got some summer reading. 
Christopher Cologne. Smells real lovely with an original idea. This is. I've never heard this before. I haven't either. This is a self-published book, much in the indie spirit as Kev's Clerks. Oh, you don't even need to name check me. This is just a good idea. You could stand on your own, man. You don't even have to be like, hey, remember Clerks? This is nothing like that. <laughs> this is way more original than Clerks. This is a good idea, man. Why didn't I think of this? I need something to read. This book is part of the Comic Books Heavy Metal Video Games Trilogy Book 2. Odd I See, A Tale from the Road, coming soon. Right on, man. It's part of a trilogy. This is the first part. Way to write, man. He's seeking a literary agent. Motherfuckers, anybody out there? There ain't no literary agents listening to this show, I assure you, sure. Sure. I assure you, sure. But somebody know a literary agent? Hook a motherfucker up! Chris Cologne come up with an original idea. I should tell Raskin. That's a good fucking idea, to be honest with you. That's a fucking rom-com right there. Megan, get Raskin on the phone. (laughs) Isn't it possible to get Raskin on the phone? No? Yeah. I want to run it past him, man. I want to, and if it happens, I get a taste, Chris Cologne. I get a a whiff, if you will. The book could also be ordered on www.com. L-U-L-U dot com. That's Lulu dot com. I understand that. I just want to spell it out. <laughs> <laughs> Normally one says that that spells it. Still, Lulu dot com. What is that? Do you know what it is? I don't know. All right. The book could also be ordered on www dot Lulu dot com. Search for Double Jackpot Christopher Cologne. A paperback version of the book is $15 and a PDF file is only five bucks. Five dollars is yeah. insanely inexpensive. Fifteen is not even that bad for a hard for a paperback version. No, this is a million dollar idea right here. Like a, a fucking a movie about a dude who fucking is stuck between two chicks, both of who play his birthday and win the lottery. Come on, come! I, like I can it. see that trailer. Chris Cologne is on to something. Nobody else can smell it but me. I'll read it. Thank you. I'm gonna make that smelly joke. I all. know you're trying to get me to laugh again. It worked once. <laughs> Double Jackpot is a self-published book by Chris Cologne, man. It's the first book in his comic books, heavy metal, video games trilogy. Book two, Odd I See, A Tale from the Road, should be coming out soon. Get all the information. Chris Cologne, like a motherfucker, and his totally book, read this. Double Jackpot. I'm serious. I'm going to recommend that to fucking Raskin. That's, how is that not a movie? You know what I'm saying? This could be a sexy movie. You could do an R-rated version. There could be nudie in it. and You could sell them fucking both chicks. Maybe a little penetration. Maybe a butthole shot. No butthole, no care. I would like to formally apologize to Christopher Cologne. Right no, now, sex but... sells. <laughs> Chris Cologne will appreciate that. He's like, thanks for throwing a few buttholes in there, man. Don't forget to check out Two Strangers One Podcast.net, your one stop resource for everything show related. You can find links to subscribe to us on iTunes or on Stitcher. You could also find links to buy my book, Double Jackpot, on Two Strangers One Podcast.net. Fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, you're cool, and fuck you, I'm out.